Okay, oh. so in our first part, second and third part of the human evolution lectures, we were looking at what makes primates special and unique, human connections to all the primates, what makes us mammals, etc. And we all got into some of the, just kind of highlighting some of the main hominids in the hominid family tree. You know, individuals that are ancestors of ours or relatives of ours in the hominid side of the family tree. The last lecture left off with Homo ergaster. We were talking about this group, and as I mentioned, it's looked at as the most successful group of hominids for a huge, huge variety of reasons. I mean, the first one, they were around over 1.6 million years. They existed for a tremendous amount of time compared to any other known hominid this species was out there for a long, long time. They colonized and spread all across Africa into large parts of Asia and Europe as well. You know, they were the first group to actually control fire. And these are all monumental events in hominid evolution. And a lot of it was done by this group here. They were an early group. Uh, they're one of the earlier groups of genus Homo that we know and recognize, and just an unbelievably successful group. So again, we talked about the range. There is hominid evidence of Homo ergaster all across Europe, Asia, and Africa here. So all these highlighted green areas, that's where we're seeing evidence that this species existed. They lived in groups, they had social structure, they controlled fire, they would move seasonally from one location to the next. Just a very, very successful group. <clears throat> and it's thought this is a group that gave rise to Homo sapiens in Africa. Specifically, Homo sapiens evolved and first showed up in Africa. The oldest physical evidence, the oldest anthropological evidence, the oldest genetic evidence, all points to Homo sapiens, all starting in Africa. After our population got big enough, we then migrated out of Africa and into Asia and Europe and across the globe. So, and I'll show you the map of that in a little bit here. But Ergaster gave rise to Homo sapiens. Ergaster is also believed to have given rise to Homo erectus in Asia and Neanderthals over there in Europe, all somewhat around the same time. So the species is evolving differently based upon different environments and different habitats and different food and different pressure from predators and diseases and different mutations and different climates. And all these variables cause things to evolve in different ways. Okay? So looking at Homo erectus, this group was very similar to Homo ergaster. They, they're roughly the same time frame, but they're specifically restricted to Asia. So we only find evidence of Homo erectus in Asia, and at this point haven't found evidence outside of Asia. But physically, very similar. They weren't as tall as Homo ergaster, a little bit shorter. But same type of group life, social structure, they were using fire. Probably learned that from the Ergaster ancestors that carried fire with them as they colonized and started to populate Asia and so on and so forth. So a lot of overlap here, but a species that is believed to have arisen or evolved from Homo ergaster. The other one we think came from Ergaster is Neanderthals, or Neanderthalensis. This is the Neanderthal man that we often look at and think of as this big brooding creature. These guys are specifically located in Europe. So it's thought Ergaster made its way into Europe. Populations there experienced different environments, different climates, different food, predators, disease, etc. than what Ergaster was seen and experiencing in Asia, as well as Ergasters in Africa. Just keep in mind, Africa's equatorial and tropical. Asia or Europe at this time is getting colder, different climate. So the traits and features that you have in a tropical environment are not going to be the same as what would evolve in a colder 
or what we could call a temperate environment, warm in the summer, cold in the winter type of environment. So Neanderthals, the evidence points to these guys being around somewhere 200,000 years ago to about 35,000 years ago. Don't see a lot of evidence indicating that they were there earlier, as in 300 or 400 or 500, and we don't see much evidence pointing to Neanderthals existing 10,000 years ago or 15. So that's a rough window for Neanderthals. <clears throat> but things we have learned and things we really, really want to keep in mind about Neanderthals, these guys were smart. They were su surviving in a very harsh environment. They often lived in caves or had camp structures. Lots of Neanderthal sites are coastal, so they use the sea. They access the resources of the ocean or estuaries. They were fishermen. They were hunters. They had group life. They had complex social structures. There's indications that these guys would trade with other groups. They would interact. They would have some form of communication because if you're trading and interacting, you have to have some type of communication method. What the language was, we can only speculate, but there would be some form of communication. Neanderthal's big key, though, what made them unique, what made them special, their little stars here, or little asterisks, is that these guys were physically They were physically adapted to the Ice Age. They were unbelievably muscular. If you were going to set up a football team or a rugby team and you could get a hold of a dozen Neanderthals, you would have an awesome team. These guys were built. They tended to be shorter than Ergasters and Erectus and modern Homo sapiens, but thick, broad muscle, pound for pound, they would outdo most modern humans. Shorter, not, or don't think dwarf, but just shorter, five, mid, five feet, five, six, five, four, kind of in that range. But again, just big muscled individuals, both males and females. That's a huge advantage in a cold environment. Muscle mass retains heat. Shorter, thicker, broader adapts you to cold. In hot environments, you want to be thin and lean and tall and lanky. But in these cold ice age environments, short and muscle is a major thing. So that's a big, big thing for Neanderthals. I mean, we see evidence they used fire. They used stone tools. They used all these things that Ergaster is using, Erectus is using. But again, Neanderthals' big thing is physical adaptation. The other major thing that surprised a lot, a lot of folks is Neanderthals were the first group to show evidence of religion. Okay? They were religious. They would bury their dead. The picture on the left, <clears throat> this is of three Neanderthal skeletons found buried together. This is a recreation of what's believed to be the burial ceremony. So they would bury their dead. That's a unique thing. That's unique to hominids, unique to more advanced cultures. Animals don't bury their dead. Yes, they may go and elephants will go past a graveyard where their relatives died, but they don't stop, dig a hole, and bury their relatives when they died. They recognize the spot, but it's a big difference between we will take time out of our lives to dig a grave, to put the person in the grave, to place weapons and tools and jewelry and food and all these things that are valuable for Neanderthals, put them in the grave with the dead individual. That tends to point towards a belief in an afterlife. Why put your weapons or tools or food in that grave unless that person's going to need it later on? If they're dead and they go to the afterlife, they need these things. So it was a very fascinating cultural awakening for people to recognize Neanderthals as religious individuals. Now, what god or gods they prayed to, we can only guess, we can only speculate, but they did bury their dead. And that's one of the anthropological indications of religion. So it's the first group that we know of that did this. We don't see it in Erectus or Gaster, the earlier ones, 
but we do see it in Neanderthals. So these guys had a lot of social life. They hunted in groups. They used fire. There's direct evidence of medicine. So they understood these plants are good. These plants are bad. This is what we can do to heal ourselves. All these traits and features are present in the Neanderthal culture. They were unbelievably fit and able to survive physical trauma. There are skeletons of Neanderthals that had multiple broken bones that had healed and the individuals continued to live. So imagine 35,000 years ago, 135,000 years ago, your group's attacking this bear, trying to kill it either for protection or for food or for whatever. The guy in the bottom's getting mauled. He's not doing so well. But the group, if that individual survived, the group would take care of him. The group would use medicine. They would try to help that person survive and heal so they could then continue to be part of the group. That's a huge, huge cultural thing for Neanderthals. Again, we see it, a lot of this in this culture, a lot more than what people originally thought was in the Neanderthal culture. So those two groups are believed to have come from Ergaster, Neanderthals in Europe, Erectus over there in Asia. The third group that evolved from Ergaster are Homo sapiens. This is us. So earliest evidence of Homo sapiens, that's, that's pretty undisputed. There's some speculation it might have started 200, 250,000, but pretty solid conclusion to say Homo sapiens showed up around 100,000 years ago, and we're still here today. Okay, so again, some, some folks are trying to draw lines of evidence to support an earlier appearance, still being determined, still being tested. But everybody, for the most part, agrees 100,000 years ago, for sure, we were here. <clears throat> and we're here. So we've been around about 100,000 years, and we've spread and migrated across every continent on the planet. So what made us so successful? Well, we all started in Africa, and the biggest keys to our success were our culture and our technology. Okay, this is what made us successful. This is what keeps us going today, culture and technology. So with technology, you increase your hunting ability. Instead of getting up close to that animal, you throw a spear from far away. There's a thing called an atlatl. It's a way to whip a spear and throw it hundreds of feet. So it decreases your chance of injury decreases your risk associated with hunting. We see a division of labor within Homo sapien cultures. Some individuals are hunters, some individuals are artists, some are doctors, some are the food gatherers. They divided labor, and as you divide labor, you increase efficiency, increased efficiency of hunting, finding food, survival, your population starts to grow. <clears throat> and our populations grew significantly. They were growing at a very rapid pace compared to other populations, and we're still growing today. So the tools and technology of Cro-Magnon Man show a significant increase in complexity. You know, whereas a Neanderthal would use brute strength and physical strength to do stuff, Cro-Magnon or Homo sapiens would use their brains. They'd figure out, hey, I can make a wrench now I'm using physics to do stuff. I can create these harpoons so that way it'll catch the fish and keep the fish on the harpoon even better than just a straight spear that a Neanderthal might have used and worked with. We also see jewelry. We see needles. We see trinkets. We see artwork within Cro-Magnon, or we can call them Homo sapiens, within their culture. The oldest evidence of art goes to Cro-Magnon. Some of these go back 60, 80, 1,000 years. We don't see art in Neanderthal society. So it's a huge, huge shift in culture and technology that enable Cro-Magnon to be successful. So what we'll look at in the last part of the lecture series here is the geographic distribution of humans across the globe.